Today on Downloaded, we've got the Chromebook from Google, we've got the MS Surface tablet, we're talking about Uber and their problems in New York City, and finally, Hermione Way, star of the Bravo series Startup Silicon Valley, is joining us. Welcome to Downloaded. This is the show where we discuss some of the most interesting tech news of the week. And uh, we talk about it with a group, too. I've got a panel of people here today. Really happy to have Hermione Way, who's here uh, from the next web, but also the star of a new reality show on Bravo, right? Hmm. <laughs> We're going to talk more about that later. Uh, Hermione, we typically drink on this show. We don't have to, but uh, we do. We have a little beer here. You're not drinking beer. you got something a little heavier right there. I'm British, so I go for the whiskey. Is it a shot you're going to do or you're going to sip it? I'm going to be a lady. I'm going to sip it. All right, good. And Patrick <laughs> Norton over there next to her, who's the star of Techzilla, is here as well. So uh, let's start off with Tech Radar by running down some of the biggest tech stories of the week. And uh, we're going to start out with uh, Google and the Chromebook. And I did, uh, last week I had a Lenovo. This week I actually brought my Chromebook. This is the older Chromebook, not the newer Chromebook. The thing about these, uh, the Chromebook in general, this one also made by Samsung, is it, it doesn't really exist without the cloud. You've got to have it connected up to the internet for storage, for apps. It's really just, as you can see here, a browser. Now the new Chromebook, slightly less powerful, 11.6-inch, uh, 1366 by 768 pixel display. It's got a dual-core processor from Samsung that uh, I can't even pronounce and I've never heard of. Exynos? So I'm gonna try Exynos? Sounds like a small Greek island. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Uh, have you ever heard of this? It's a variation on an ARM processor. Yeah, yeah so uh, it's got uh, USB, HDMI output, 100 gig, free Google Drive storage. Um, so let's talk about the Chromebook for a minute. The netbooks, are they coming back or is this just a, a, an example of uh, Google like, well, we, we want to make people do it, but we don't know what's going to happen. Hermione, what do you think? Have you played with these or uh, what? I just came back from Africa, and yeah. Apple is just far too expensive for anybody in Africa. So everybody's using Android. This would be great for people in Africa that um, want to you know, just surf the web, and you can't really build much on it. But, you right. can... well, but it has to have a network connection. You can't do anything without it. And um, you said well, you, you just got you, back you, from you, Africa. Is there, how are the network connections there? Are they ubiquitous enough? Yeah, they're not great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe, maybe we'll get there, but not yet. Patrick, what were you going to say? Well, it, it, I mean, it's got a USB port. It has some local storage. They're, they're saying, like, you're not going to keep your entire media collection on there. You're not going to keep all of your documents on there. But one of the things they're pushing is, like, you know, 30 bucks a month or 15 bucks a month, you know, a small business can outfit all of their people with Chromebooks, and then if somebody decides to, like, leave the corporation, you can wipe all their information, you can cut off their access to data. It's very managed, but, yeah, I keep looking at it and thinking, like, yeah, it's like a netbook without a real operating system. Yeah, and, and so this one's got 3G in it or 4G. I've got the ability to, uh, I think they're going to give me three months free. Uh, but so I'm not ready for a notebook that requires me to be connected up to the Internet to use it at all times. Um, one of the other things that people have been rumoring, rumoring about, I don't even say rumoring about, rumoring. With, uh, from our friends at Google is uh, a $99 seven inch tablet. And here I brought my Nexus, which is a $250 seven inch tablet. Uh, is there a market for a sub $100 tablet that's, uh, that's, that's like this? Um, Patrick, first of all, what do you think? You've tested some of these recently. Yeah, I mean, the, there already is a market for this. Uh, China, India, all these other countries around the world, they already have, especially in China, there's these, you, you can basically custom build to a price point a 50 or $100 tablet. Um, you're giving up screen quality, right? This, you know, the cheaper yeah. the device gets, the more awful the screen looks. But in terms of having you know, Android support and all of the processor and, and uh, memory you need to do stuff, they're amazing deals. I think it's a huge market. I think you're going to see Google pushing down there. I think Amazon's going to push down there. You know, it's funny. I um, went over uh, to uh, um, the website of Fry's when I first heard about this right. story, which Fry's, if you don't know, is basically the supermarket for geeks here in Silicon Valley. You can get anything you want from, um, from e toaster ovens to uh, e-proms and uh, uh, everything in between. They had a bunch of $85, $95 mm -hmm. tablets. Did you see a lot of that over in Africa when you were there? Um, yes. Uh, everything's on Android, really. Nobody yeah. has, has MacBooks. Um, it's just far too expensive. So, you know, for, for people who just want to browse online, um, I think Android is definitely better in emerging markets. Yeah, is it mostly phones, or is it people like going up to maybe uh, the Samsung Note that's maybe a five and a half, six inch screen, or all the way up to seven or bigger? It's no, there are no, there are hardly any smartphones. It's all first generation, you know, your old Nokia's, um, right. first generation phones, feature phones. Feature phones. Uh, and, and they work. There's, you know, there's a service called M Pesa. It's kind of like a Google wallet that actually works and so they're, they're not really needing these yet. Next story I think is really interesting this week is about uh, Windows 8 uh, coming out pretty soon and Windows RT mm -hmm. uh, and this was this story was awesome the, the Verge the, a reporter Sean Hollister actually did real reporting online which is you know, shocking uh, 
found out, uh, called up about eight different Microsoft stores to ask the folks at the store, hey, what's the difference between Windows RT and Windows 8? Can I run my old Windows apps on Windows RT? Windows RT, the OS running on the tablet, uh, the Surface tablet. Um, Patrick, is this confusion? I mean, he found a lot of confusion. They were saying, oh yeah, you can run all your Windows apps on, uh, on Windows RT. Um, oh, maybe not x86 apps, that's only for developers. He's confused, I'm confused. <laughs> Are consumers gonna be confused and is this a problem for Microsoft? Yeah, I think it's gonna be kind of ugly when it launches. Because so Windows RT is essentially the version of, of Windows 8 that runs on tablets. It runs on the ARM processor and you can only run applications that are available in the Windows Store, right? That means you have to buy them twice. If they're even available. Uh, and, yeah, and, and who wants to buy their apps twice? I mean, I did that with CDs, right, in movies. <laughs> I don't want to buy my apps twice. I just spent 20 bucks for TweetBot, so apparently I'm willing to buy free apps for 20 bucks at least once or twice. But yeah, I think, it's, I think a lot of people are going to go, I want the $500 one, they're going to get it home, they're going to stare at all their old software, all their old software is going to stare back at them, they're going to like pick through things, find the Windows Store, and then they're going to get really irritated. Yeah. Now, to Microsoft's credit, they said the reason why they're not uh, doing this is because it's a slower processor, it's a mm -hmm. less capable machine. But what I want to know is, if that's the case, it's got to have an emulation mode. Why can't I run my old Windows XP or Windows 95 apps, and I actually happen to bring a couple with me? If I got one of these, wouldn't it be awesome if I could run my Dilbert <laughs> screensaver that works on Windows 95? I mean, this would be great on one of those tablets, or, and this would be even better, what about, and this is the classic, there you go, you can have that. Is that Windows 3.1? Uh, it could be Windows 3.1. You're is. aging yourself, The Jim. classic original Monkey Island. This I want to run on my tablet, too, <laughs> with the scum interface. The most amazing thing about this story this is, is the, the budget that they They had 1.5 billion marketing budget, and they still couldn't educate their, their, custo their the customer service reps. Exactly, they spent all that money to educate their customer service reps, and they still didn't get anywhere with it. Patrick, don't lose any of those floppies, okay? Oh my okay? god. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get uh, your floppy out in public. All right, I'm so not touching that statement. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, we're, we're going to move There's on. There's nowhere you know, safe to go with that. We have reconstruct that right now. We are going to move on to talk about gentle. Apple and Color. So Color, if you don't know, uh, Color was, a, uh, was a, a, a big startup, raised $41 million, run by Bill Nguyen, who started Seven, Lala. Really a great entrepreneur. I've known him for a long time. Um, I think sunk by there on hubris. It was a photo-based startup. Now, and photo startups over the last year and a half, two years, probably a good idea. I mean, Instagram, how much do they sell for? Billion. A billion dollars. So, not a bad idea, but they were, they just, they, they were like, my stuff doesn't stink. We raised 41 million, we're the best. And they were really, I think, they were sort of destroyed by their hype, right, Patrick? I, I, I still don't understand what their product was supposed to do. Photo sharing up. Don't we have 19 of those? Yes, well, we had, but we had Instagram. I mean, one of them rose to the top and somebody spent a billion dollars on it. Yeah, but Instagram, you could put funky filters on, you know, kind of like hipsterish. That's like, worth a billion dollars, you're right. Uh -huh. Silly me, <laughs> silly Bill. Well, I mean, the, the, the Instagram billion dollar thing is also kind of weird because it was, you know, <laughs> Facebook before the IPO, you know, Zuckerberg's like, I want this has control of the company, spends the money, you know what I mean? It's like, he's, I guess he kind of knew at that point they were going to make a ridiculous amount of money on the IPO, and he's like, screw it, I want this, I want, the, I want this, whatever the problem is with, with Instagram, he wanted it out of his head, so he spent a ridiculous amount of money to acquire a fun app with, with a nice user Well, I think base, the problem but, was Facebook didn't have a mobile strategy, right? I mean, Facebook's had problems with mobile, and said, let's take this mobile app and bring mm -hmm. it in. But was that, was the Instagram thing, did, Hermione, do you think it was an aqua hire? No, I mean, for a billion dollars, yeah. I, I think it was user acquisition. You yeah. know, they had a lot Customer of... Customer acquisition, right, yeah, that's a good point. They had a lot of users. Um, I still don't think there's really a great revenue model for Facebook mobile. I mean, there's, there's no adverts. It's yeah, more like... I mean, Flickr. Flickr <laughs> still, you know what I mean? The original photo sharing app still doesn't really have a business model, right. does it? Pro so, accounts? Well, Color certainly didn't end up with a business model. I mean, look, <laughs> let's see what happened to them. It, it turns out that Apple is not buying Color. What they're doing is they're just doing an aqua hire. They're bringing the engineers on. And the board actually said, according to VentureBeat, that the board's just going to shut the company down. Hermione, you talked to a lot of VCs. I mean, what do you think was the real problem with Color? Was it that they just got ahead of themselves, or that they were just too, too over the top, or what? I just think from the start it was a complete failure. You know, they they had they didn't clearly define their product. Uh, their team left. Some of the key members in the team left mm -hmm. very very early on, and uh, you know they raised far too much money. They they weren't hungry enough for it. Well, they did. They had. Too much money, you know, in the bank, the CEO was taking holidays in Hawaii, and they let it slip. Well, look, <laughs> startups, you, you need to have a little bit of chutzpah, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, to be a startup CEO. 
Uh, and, and you know, you're doing a startup now. You've got to at least, you've got to be, you've got to have a lot of self-confidence to do it. But were they probably a little over the edge? Well, I think uh, Color obviously needs their own reality TV show. The, de the desperate <laughs> entrepreneurs of Color. I think uh, that would be very entertaining. Reality TV. We'll talk about reality <laughs> TV in a little bit. Um, but we're going to move on to our next story before we get there, which is on Uber. Uh, we love Uber here in San Francisco. Service where on your smartphone you can get a, just go on there. A cab shows up, takes you where you want to go. You don't have to give them any money. It bills your credit card. Well, they tried to get to New York. Patrick and I have both lived in Manhattan, and we know that New York is a town that, if anything, is entrenched by the, the organizations that run it, one of them being the TLC, the Taxi Limo Commission. Uber went in, tried to sign up a bunch of yellow cabs, uh, didn't get enough cabs, ran out of uh, basically demand outstrip supply. They pulled out. Um, is this, uh, does this mean that New York isn't ready for Web 3.0 apps, Patrick? I, I don't know. I mean, the problem is it's like, I, I've never, I never had a problem getting a cab in New York City. There's like 12,000 medallion cabs. There's all these startups in San Francisco that are trying to solve the cab problem because the cab ecosystem, we'll use a, a good like Web 2.0 buzzword, the, the, the taxi cab ecosystem in San Francisco, exactly. It's terrible, right? It's, it's horrendous, right? You know what I mean? You can call three cab companies and maybe get one cab in 20 minutes if any of them show up. And you've got apps like Taxi Magic that are integrated with the uh, the distributor, not the distributor, the dispatchers. Yeah, the actual cab dispatching right. companies, right? You know, and Uber's like, we're going to kick ass, we're going to take names, we're going to solve a problem that doesn't exist in New York. They piss off some of the. Uh, yeah, it seems like they've pissed off everybody. Did they piss off they the Taxi Limousine off. Commission? They had to. I mean, yeah, but they had they had to. If they'd gone in and said, you know, can we do this, they wouldn't have ever got there. Well, but Taxi Magic, I mean, they, they've got stuff running in major cities. They've got it running in Chicago, San Francisco. It seems like they have it everywhere but New York. So is New York like the special problem for taxi cab services? Yeah. Does anybody out here who doesn't travel nine months a year even care about <laughs> finding a taxi cab? Well, uh, here's the thing in New York, and, and uh, limos.com is there, and they right. do a reasonably good job. You go to, there are a number of these gypsy cab companies. Um, they're black cab companies that... Uh, we'll send a car to you, like Carmel. I know right. Carmel's number because I lived in New York. And if I ever need a car, I can just call Carmel. Right. I think it's seven 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 seven. They didn't pay me for that, and they'll send a car over. So in that sense, maybe you don't need Uber in New York. I actually think you do, but that's just one of the things. You got the best public transportation system in in, in North America is in New York City. Anyway, right? it's part of the magic, you know, putting your arm out, your legs out. <laughs> you know? Speaking of legs, wait, do that again. What are you wearing? I am wearing. Wait, do, those are pretty cool. Are those called pants? Tetris pants. Tetris pants. Yes. Those are awesome. Yes. Blackmilkclothing.com. Uh, these have been all over the world with me. They're very comfortable and they get you through immigration, apparently. Really? How do yeah. they get you through immigration? Well, uh, we had a lot of camera equipment with us when we were going around the world, and uh, I think it was in Argentina, they were like, you're not coming through. And then I moved to the side of the, the machine, and he was like, oh my god, great pants, okay, off you go. <laughs> wow. I don't think that would work for me. <laughs> uh, I'm showing up with stretchy Tetris pants next time I cross the border. I'm going to see how that works for me. As long me. as I'm not with you, man. <laughs> uh, let's move on to, uh, I think, what is our last story in this, uh, in this group. Google Data Center Secrets. Patrick, this is a story you surfaced. Yeah. Wired story, they let a reporter into one of those secretive data centers where Google does everything, really their secret sauce in North Carolina, and, and showed it off. What did you learn by reading that story? It was, it was amazing because, right, you know, we've, we've always known Google was willing to engineer their own answers to problems, whether it was like, screw it, we're going to use consumer-grade hard drives, and then we're going to study the hard drive failure rates and see if enterprise hard drives are worth the money. And in this case, Stephen Levy uh, for Wired does this amazing walkthrough of this. I mean, it's stunningly beautiful, right, just from the color coding on the pipes for the coolant systems, and talks about how they architected the building and the servers and the arrangements to basically make as, uh, as efficient and inexpensive to operate as possible. You know, all the way down to really silly things like, hey, if we can keep the hallways down around 75 degrees, everybody gets to wear shorts to work, and then we don't have to cool the building down another 25 or 30 degrees or 10 degrees or whatever is considered you know, functional for a, a data warehouse. It was just really fascinating, and the pictures are gorgeous. Yeah, well, um, the, the thing that I saw was interesting is that data centers take like 1.5% or something like that of all yeah. the world's energy. Um, how was the how was the data that uh, data connectivity and stuff you saw in Africa? Did it feel like that there was huge vast tracts of servers in, in Africa that were accessible as well? Actually, what's very interesting is in Rwanda, the government just finished a ninety million dollar plan to put a fiber optic cable throughout the country. Oh, so wow. Rwanda has some of the fastest internet, you know, as fast as America, if not faster, in the world. And they're really trying to become the next Silicon Valley of Africa. Um, so very interesting stuff going on. 
there. I actually thought it was going to be vo very boring looking through the pictures because, <laughs> I mean, it's essentially a load of plastic and cables. Right, right, right. right. But um, if you go into Street View, you can mm -hmm. actually walk through the data centers. Oh, cool. Oh, it, that's it's, cool. It's pretty cool, yeah. I actually, I that. spotted some guys in shorts in the walking around <laughs> data center. <laughs> You laugh, but it's like it seems like really silly. It's like, oh yeah, you know what? You don't have to have the, you know, I mean, let them wear shorts. They don't have to go down to sixty degrees. How much energy do you save there? It's, it's you save a lot of energy. Although there is one guy apparently there uh, who wants to suffer in the heat, wearing his stormtrooper costume, walking through. Maybe. I saw that as well <laughs> on Street View. In the Isn't that yeah, he was standing there. Yeah. That's amazing. Storming the Street View yeah. pictures. Um, <laughs> all right, so look, we're going to go back to hardware announcements here. Uh, we actually went out and asked a couple people in the office whether they'd rather have a Microsoft Surface tablet, a Google Chromebook, or an iPad mini, and here's what they had to say. I'm probably not gonna get any of them. Um, I love the Chromebook as an idea, but I would never use it instead of my laptop. The Surface sounds really interesting with the touch type keyboard, um, and the iPad mini is a smaller iPad, which sounds awesome. So if I were to get any of those three, I think I'd probably get the iPad mini. What are those? If it's not a lens or a, or a camera? I don't want it. I think I'm gonna get the iPad mini because I feel trapped by Apple's ecosystem. I don't think I'm gonna get either of them, actually, because my first generation iPad works just fine. Well, I probably won't be getting any of them, but if I were to get one, I would get the Surface because I just want Microsoft to succeed because they haven't done anything in a long time, so. I'm cheering them on. I'll probably be getting the iPad mini, mainly because I'm already kind of in the Apple ecosystem and I've played with the new Chromebook. I think it's a little too big for my taste and kind of plasticky. The Surface looks really nice. I kind of definitely want to give it a try. I, I think that Windows 8 is really interesting. And, uh, but yeah, I think iPad mini all the way for me. All right, now we're going to slow down a little bit and spend a little more time with our guest Hermione Way of the next web. Um, also. And I didn't realize this until we started talking about this. You're co-star of this upcoming Silicon Valley series on Bravo. Tell me about that for a minute. What's, what's going on there? Okay, so it's called Startup Silicon Valley, and mm. it's following the intertwining lives of six young people trying to make it in Silicon Valley. Uh, so me and my brother are two of the cast members, and we actually built a startup called Ignite on the mm. show. And we literally uh, went from idea to hardware to product on the show. And uh, I mean, it was stressful building a startup anyway, but with a camera crew of 60 people <laughs> in your face. Yeah, I can it was, imagine. It's so pretty exhausting. Is, is, it, is it fair to call this the real startups of Silicon Valley? Um, you know, there's a whole range of startups. You know, mm -hmm. there's a guy that was in Y Combinator, there's a girl that used to work for Ampush Media, mm -hmm. and she's just doing her own startup. So, you know, it's, it's our realities mm -hmm. of trying to build a startup in right. Silicon Valley. It might not be everybody's reality, but it's ours. So uh, tell me about your brother. I didn't even know you had a brother. Yes, my brother is uh, five years older than me, mm -hmm. and he was one of the first dot-com entrepreneurs in Europe. Um, made 25 million and lost 25 million on the first dot-com boom. Um, but we have a very interesting story because our parents divorced when I was two years old and he grew up with my father and I grew up with my mother. And we didn't really know each other until we moved to Silicon Valley. And uh, now we're working together, we're living together, we almost killed each other. Wow. So you're going to have to watch the show to find out how we uh, cope doing a stuff. Okay, so the show's on Bravo. When does it debut? Bravo, uh, November the 5th, okay. 10 p.m., right after Real Housewives. Real Housewives, Real Housewives. Yes. So, look, there's been a, a little bit of a, a, of a kerfuffle around this. I think there was an article this week, uh, why would anyone want to start a reality TV show? You wrote a rather interesting rebuttal on it. Um, tell me a little bit about some of the, the, the back and forth and, and kind of where it's coming from and your point of view on it. I think the real question here is why wouldn't anyone want to have a TV show? Uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, it's an amazing marketing opportunity to get our products in front of millions of Americans. Uh, Bravo goes out to 88 million Americans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're competing with things like Honey Boo Boo. And if we can inspire one American to, uh, you know, that has a great idea to, to get off their couches and to pursue their idea and have a go at building building their dreams, then in my opinion, job done. Right, but look, TV in America, as Patrick and I both know, because we were at a startup <laughs> television network that didn't end up making it, is also about ratings. And in many ways that means lowest common denominator. How can we appeal to the most number of people that will watch and absorb the advertising? Um, just sitting around watching people building and, and coding a product is, doesn't make great television. We tried that. It didn't work. Um, 
What? Uh, and yet I'm still employed. Yeah, it's well, just that. Hey, that's what the web is for, right? <laughs> we can watch you coding, and it's actually really interesting on the internet. That, that, so, that may be the most boring thing you could ever put on television. But uh, it's also, but it's also, it's like the classic, you know, Bravo. You guys aren't sitting around a kitchen table in business clothes talking about stuff. It's out by the pool. They're chasing you around. You create, you know. I, I won't. I won't say manufactured drama because it's real drama. Because mm -hmm. starting a company sucks under the mm -hmm. best of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Was it stressful having cameras around? Did um, that like nothing? Amp it nothing up? is scripted. It's all mm -hmm. just it's also, yeah, following good. us as we go. And um, you know, I mean, it was a stressful experience. It mm -hmm. was an amazing. It's probably probably one of the most traumatic but amazing experiences of my life. So now I've got to know this from the discovery side. Is they shot forty to sixty hours for every hour of the show. Yeah. Yeah. Do they, I mean, is that what happened here too? You think that's roughly the same average? Yeah, we were filming every day from uh, May to August. Wow. Um, so it was pretty intense. Um, but you know, it's really going to show middle America uh, what it's like to try and attempt to, to build the next big thing in Silicon Valley. And um, hopefully uh, we can inspire some people to, to do the same thing. Now there are a couple of different shows that are coming out that I, I won't say have similar themes, but um, kind of play off of this. So your show is one of them. There is, uh, here at uh, Discovery, the Science Network, we've got a show based on uh, the, the guys on Stuff You Should Know, Josh and Chuck, who are podcasters. And it's a show that sort of follows them, how they come up with their ideas, that is actually scripted. Uh, and then we've got the, uh, the guys, uh, the cat guys, um, the Cheeseburger right. Network doing a show as well. Uh, is this indicative of uh, a sort of renewed interest in startups and new media and what's going on, or are these just three things that happen randomly together? I think, you know, geek culture, technology has become mainstream these days. Uh, what's, what's the TV show that everyone watches with the three geeky guys and the pen, penny? Big Bang Theory? Big Bang Theory. Oh, big, okay, Sorry, I had, a, I had a drink. Cool. So, um, cheers to <laughs> cheers. that. Um, big Bang Theory. So, um, yeah, you know, that's one of the most popular shows in America right now. And, you know, if I'm honest with you, there, I think people were uh, lamenting the show because mm -hmm. they think it's going to give Silicon Valley a bad name. Right. It's going to be all about partying. But don't tell me that engineers don't party. Because some of the best parties I've been to in Silicon Valley have been put on by the hottest companies, Dropbox, Airbnb, Zynga. So people in Silicon Valley work hard, they play harder, and there's going to be that balance and in the Hermione, teacher. that's been going on for a long time because when Patrick and I both moved out here in 1997 to do Tech TV, which was the beginning of the first boom, for about three years, all the people we worked with did not need to eat or drink on their own coin. They could have gone to a party every single right. night. It yeah. was a little bit out of control. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, you remember those days. You, you drove yeah. home a maybe, lot of people. Yes. Maybe he doesn't I mean, remember exactly. those days. No, no, I, I, I've been sober for like 22 years. I have, I've learned more horrible things about startups from, from incredibly drunken people driving home than I really, yeah. I, was, I, I still don't believe the amount of money that just got utterly wasted back then. Well, we, we will find out in early November how that comes out. Yes. Really interested in seeing that. I'm also really interested in seeing the startup you guys built, which was a health monitor uh, running on an, iP uh, an iPhone, right? Yeah, so we basically um, came up with a device that turns your iPhone or your smartphone into a weight scales. And we really mm. want to have a go at solving um, the obesity problem mm. in America, because as you both know, um, it's, <laughs> sorry, I mean, don't mean that like Thanks. that. But, well, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> as you know, have some more beer. It's low fat. <laughs> Keep me a it's cookie. A, it's a big problem. Yes. And, um, no pun intended. Here, here's, here's what I would put in my, in my cell phone app to cure the obesity uh, epidemic. Um, cell phone, put it in your pocket. It doesn't stop ringing or vibrating until you get up out of your chair and start walking around. Like Every that. 10 minutes it does that. I like that. That is my idea for yeah. your next startup or your next version. Okay. How do you like that? All Thank right. you very much. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, Hermione. Thanks a lot, Patrick, for coming and joining me today on Downloaded. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Google+. Subscribe right here on TechFeed. Let us know what you think. And uh, if there's stories you want us to talk about, let us know as well. And we will see you next time.